Okay, I think we'll get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Annika Smith, and I'm the director of the Windsor Law Center for Cities and associate professor at Windsor Law at the University of Windsor. I'm coming to you today, and the University of Windsor is situated on the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy, the Ojibwe, the Odawa, and the Potawatomi people. I want to take a moment just to welcome all of you and to say that we are thrilled to have people joining us from Windsor, from, uh, uh, from across Canada, from across uh, around the world. And I think that speaks both to the interest in uh, the topic that we're discussing today, which is cycling and building the mid-sized cycling city. And it also speaks to our speakers uh, popularity today and the momentum that they're helping to build around the world. The Windsor Law Center for Cities has been uh, around for two years now, and I'll take a moment just to tell you a little bit about it. We are a law school based center focused on the law and policy tools, um, working to build inclusive and sustainable cities. And we work on teaching, research and community engagement around these, these tools. We've had the pleasure over the last two years to work with a number of community partners within, the, within our own Windsor Essex community across Canada and increasingly globally. Active transportation is very much in the wheelhouse of the work that we do on climate. It's tied to all the other good city building pieces that we are focused on, including good housing and sustainable housing, um, and thinking about what it means to, to build and to support uh, the legal tools uh, of building good cities all around the world. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll take a moment to introduce uh, the session this afternoon, and then I'm going to turn over the floor to a couple of, of our community partners to say a very quick word of welcome. Much has been written about the multimodal successes of Dutch cities and towns where walking, cycling and public transit often in combination with each other have been the dominant modes of transport for nearly 50 years. In the face of a global pandemic, cities of, of all sizes around the world are realizing that to become more safe, inclusive and resilient places, private automobiles must play more of a background role. And this is, uh, forms the focus of much of the work that the Bruntlets are doing. Um, what they tell us as well is that there are concrete lessons that mid-sized Canadian cities can learn from the Netherlands who after a similar crisis in the 1970s decided to take their previously car-based environment and mobility network in a really different direction. And so we're here today to talk about how, how reducing car dependence might increase transportation equity for everyone and how we can make those changes quickly and effectively and what the examples of the Netherlands have to tell us. And I have to say as a on, on a personal note, as a first generation Canadian on one side and a father who was born in Den Haag and came to Canada at age 12, um, it's a particular pleasure for me to be able to welcome um, other Dutch Canadians or Canadian Dutch um, to, the, to, the, to our event today. Um, I want to say before I pass the floor as well, a huge thanks to our partners in bringing this uh, event together today, the Windsor-Essex County Environment Committee, the Dutch Cycling Embassy, We Spark Health Institute at the University of Windsor, the City of Windsor through the ward funds uh, of Councillor Chris Holt and Bike Windsor Essex. And I'll say a word uh, a bit later about uh, an event that coming up this afternoon that Bike Windsor Essex will be a part of. And then I want also to say, and by way of segue, uh, a big thanks to two other community partners, the Windsor Essex Youth Climate Council and, uh, and Activate Transit Windsor Essex. And in fact, our own University of Windsor Law Cities and Climate Action Forum um, who have provided all kinds of support for the event today. So thank you very much for being here. I'm going to turn the floor now. I don't think that we have Jana Jandal Al-Rifai with us yet from the Youth Climate Council. So I'm going to turn the floor over to Jess Bondi, who is with Activate Transit Windsor-Essex to say a quick word of hello. Jess. Yes, thank you, Annika. And I just wanted to uh, thank all of the attendees for being with us and being part of this conversation. Um, you know, I've been taking part of uh, conversations all weekend. We had the uh, Earth Day celebration on Sunday with the city at, at Malden Park, and we also had um, our own community mandate activate Transit Windsor Essex on Friday. So um, I've had lots of time to connect with the community over the last weekend and just talk about how, you know, how we create changes and, and it's by being part of conversations like this. So Melissa and Chris, thank you for taking the time uh, to be be here with us uh, today. And Annika, thank you for taking the time to put together important uh, talks like this. <laughs> My son's saying thank you in the background here. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let me turn the floor, uh, actually I'll turn the floor in a moment to Rolina de Cruz from, from the Cities and Climate Action Forum Policy Clinic at the University of Windsor. 
Um, I just want to, to jump in and, and make a couple of quick logistical notes. As you many of you know, for those of you who are local here, we have two events following the, the virtual event today, um, very much in the spirit that while Zoom is great and allows us to connect across communities, um, what's also really important is that we connect within our community and be able to continue the conversation. So for those of you who are local in Windsor-Essex or close by, uh, at six o'clock tonight, the Windsor Essex, uh, Bike Windsor Essex will be hosting a ride from their uh, their office on Monmouth and all the information is on our website, I'll post in the chat, um, to the Sandwich Brewing Company where all participants are welcome to join us uh, for a reception from 6.30 to 8. Uh, we will be, I see your note, Clinton, we will be uh, inside given the weather uh, and that will be 6.30 to 8 tonight. First drink and snacks are on, on, on the organizers, uh, so please do join us if you can. With that, I'd like to turn the floor to Relina de Cruz uh, from the Cities and Climate Action Forum to introduce properly Melissa and Chris Bratlett from Moda City. Hello, good evening, everybody. As uh, professors said, I, my name is Relina. I am one of the students in um, the Windsor Law Cities and Climate Action. Uh, I will briefly introduce our keynote speakers today as well as, as, well as some of their impressive work. Um, Melissa and Chris Bruntlett are Canadian authors and urban mo mobility advocates who strive to communicate the benefits of sustainable transport, such as cycling, and inspire healthier, happier human scale cities. Now based in Delft, the Netherlands, Melissa works in biocontinental consultancy Mobicon in supporting the promotion of Dutch knowledge, policy, and principles across Europe and North America. As communications manager for the Dutch Cycling Embassy, Chris uses his knowledge and passion to share lessons for global cities wishing to learn from the country's extraordinary success. They are also co-authors of two books, Building the Cycling City, the Dutch Blueprint for, for Urban Vitality, which outlines how to create a great cycling city. Another book also, Curbing Traffic, The Human Case for Fewer Cars in Our Lives, which explains why this is so important. They have worked in cities of all sizes across Canada and around the world, including Guelph, Hamilton, Sarnia, and Waterloo. The Bruntlets will speak for, for 45 minutes, after which there will be a time for moderated audience question and answers. Please use the Q&A function on your screen to add a question at any time. Please note that questions will be screened before they appear to the audience and must maintain a note of, civ of civility and respect for all. Thank you. Okay, so with that, uh, we will get started. Um, so first off, uh, thank you to Annika, Relina, and Jess for the introduction and for being part of the team that uh, welcomed us to speak with you all tonight or today. No, it's tonight. <laughs> uh, almost. Um, so it's it's into the evening here for us. Um, it's, it's our pleasure to be uh, here uh, presenting for Center for Cities. Uh, and talking about our work and what inspires us. Uh, as was noted today, we're gonna talk about building the mid-sized cycling city. Uh, so one of the focuses today will be how um, a lot of the things we've been learning about best practices um, in terms of Dutch practice, but also international practice can be applied to cities like Windsor to start bringing about more change in terms of sustainable mobility and moving people uh, from car dominance to other more sustainable options for transport. Uh, so thank you for the wonderful introduction. A little bit more about me. Um, I, so as I said, I work for Mobicon and we have offices in the Netherlands here, but also in Ottawa in Canada. Uh, and my role with the organization is as engagement and communications advisor, working a lot with um, Canadian and American municipalities and organizations to help translate Dutch context to local streets uh, to make them much more sustainable, uh, working with communities and helping to communicate the benefits of those changes. And on the other side of our partnership, uh, I am, uh, as was indicated, the marketing and communication manager for the Dutch Cycling Embassy, which is a, an organization that was created by the national government in the Netherlands, uh, specifically to export the knowledge and expertise that exists in this country. So we have a network of about 90 organizations from both the public and private sector uh, that we're able to bring to the table and help cities and regions learn from this country. Uh, and we will be further engaged with Windsor uh, in the weeks ahead with uh, additional uh, engagement sessions and, and workshops, uh, which we're very much looking forward to. So without further ado, uh, let's get started. You're going to hear a lot about cycling today, and uh, it's because uh, it is uh, the 
the topic that we tend to focus on through our work and our advocacy. Um, but it's important to stress that cycling is not the end goal. More cycling is nice, but it has to be with a larger uh, intention in mind. Uh, filling up the cycle paths in and of itself is, is fine, but uh, it's, cities are more successful when they tie that, uh, that goal of more cycling to these larger aspirations uh, that they would like to reach. And for every city, it's different. It's, it's not the same uh things uh, the same challenges that they're facing the same uh reasons that they are looking to reallocate road space and create modal shift but it's largely under this uh umbrella of reducing car dominance reducing car dependence creating places where cars are not required but they're optional uh to participate in society and we, we've summarized some of the many benefits here uh we could have probably filled many other <coughs> continuous slides but the stress here is that cycling is a tool to achieve these end goals and that cycling is part of a larger mix of modalities from walking cycling public transportation all the way down to yes cars uh the dutch still do use their cars just uh they're able to pick the right mobility or modality for the 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 task at hand and that's really what we're stressing in 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 the, the case studies that we will present so at the we're just going to start at the <laughs> what we often hear in terms of when we present we've spent a lot of time focused on what the dutch can offer in terms of knowledge and best practice but we often have uh brought back to us very similar reasons why what works here in the Netherlands couldn't work elsewhere, that it's flat, that culturally they're different, they've just grown up on bicycles, that they're more altruistic, uh, any number of reasons. Um, but what we hope to present to you today is that that is in fact not the case. It, a lot of these lessons are very applicable in a wide context of cities and help you understand that it actually wasn't always this way in the Netherlands either. Yeah, as, as Melissa likes to stress, the, the Netherlands didn't rise up out of the North Sea with all this infrastructure pre-built. It was a conscious choice uh, and a fairly recent choice. Uh, but this map really speaks volumes. It's the a heat map of the cycling infrastructure in Europe. You can almost pick out the border uh, between the Netherlands, Germany and Belgium, uh, such as the concentration of cycling infrastructure in this country. The numbers are quite astounding. 37,000 kilometers of segregated cycling infrastructure, uh, nearly half of which was built in the last 20 years. So it's still, uh, as we emphasize, a fairly recent development, a conscious development. Uh, but that more than any other reason, more than the weather, more than the culture, more than the terrain, uh, is largely why the Dutch cycle in the amounts that they do. The other reality is uh, that traffic coming is a big part of those road networks in terms of encouraging uh, cycling uh, and walking for all ages and abilities. And that comes with that traffic coming, 80% uh, of all of the roads in the Netherlands are traffic calm to a speed of 30 kilometers an hour or less. And so we know through countless studies that in a collision uh, between a vulnerable road user and an automobile, the severity of the injuries reduces drastically when we reduce our speeds to 30 kilometers an hour or less. And so that in turn makes basically every residential street a de facto bicycle street uh, because cars are moving slower. Uh, the street environment has been calmed in a way that forces uh, them to move and behave in a way that is safer when sharing that space with bicycles uh, and people on those bicycles or any sort of cycle, uh, be they young, old, male, female, uh, or otherwise. And then the third piece of the puzzle is the, the monetary contribution that goes to uh, cycling. It's not seen as a, a nice to have, it's a need to have in terms of the transportation expenditures. So uh, it's very difficult to put a, a precise number on the amounts that are invested in this country, but the best guesses are between 30 and 35 euros per person per year. That's about 500 million euros uh, each year that goes into cycling. Uh, sometimes it's spectacular infrastructure like you see here, the Hoven Ring, the floating roundabout in Eindhoven. Uh, most of the time, it's just plain old red asphalt at the side of the road that people use. And, and um, it seems like a lot of money. And, and uh, But when we reframe this, not as a cost, but as an investment, 
um, the, the savings to society that are brought by this $500 million per year uh, investment are, uh, well, five or six times uh, in return, just in terms of the healthcare savings. Uh, and then when you start talking about the other savings to society, uh, the numbers are, are, are quite staggering. So what really brought us to this point in terms of the way the streets look and the way um, people move in the Netherlands is actually a relatively new phenomenon. As Chris pointed out, you know, people often think that uh, the Dutch have always been this way, uh, but in fact, it was Christ a crisis uh, in the early 1970s that got, um, that changed the course essentially for the Netherlands. And those two crises were first a road safety crisis where the number of people dying on the streets as more and more cars were coming onto the streets uh, became a cause for concern for a lot of groups. Uh, most notably was the Stop to Kinder Mord movement or Stop Child Murder, where you had advocates, parents, teachers, and children going out into the street uh, demanding safer road space. And that spurred what would be then be uh, two decades of investment in road safety. At the same time, you have the OPEC oil crisis where oil shortages uh, caused people not to be able to drive as often and also had uh, inspired the car free Sundays where the national government insisted people leave the cars at home uh, and save on gas and then you have scenes like you have in that top right there where you see children riding on the freeways and all of this together in terms of this uh, reminder of what road space could be when you remove the cars as well as demanding safer streets. Uh, really became a reminder for citizens of what city their streets had been prior to the increased dominance of automobiles on their streets, and then started demanding for greater change in their cities, uh, leading to um, a lot of changes in the 90s, and then uh, furthermore to what we see today. So those political movements turned into political change. That is, they organized and voted for politicians that were going to not ban the car, but limit the car's um, dominance within the cities. But it's this is another important point that there was no how-to manual when this decision was made, when this inflection point occurred. There was no uh, the design manual. There was no road safety policy ready. Uh, the Dutch had to figure this out for themselves. And there was a lot of trial and error over the next 20 years, a lot of quite high profile mistakes, uh, demonstration routes that were initiated by the national government in the late 1970s that were very quickly deemed failures uh, in the media and in, um, amongst the business uh, community and the uh, the residents themselves. In Tilburg, um, they created a demonstration route that didn't really connect anything to anything in the city. Uh, and shortly thereafter in The Hague, uh, a similar route that cut through the city but did not uh, give any consideration to what uh, was, was in the proximity of that route. Uh, and in that specific case, the business owners came out and protest, protested quite heavily, and they actually hired construction workers to dig out the cycle path in the middle of the night. That's uh, the photo you see in the top right corner. So, you know, the, 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 the path to bicycle paradise was not smooth and it wasn't easy. There were a lot of mistakes along the way, but uh, by the mid-1990s, the Dutch had developed this book of best practices, how to design cycling infrastructure, how to get your policy, your road safety policy right. Uh, and this is now the book that we're able to take uh, to cities around the world and say, this is where you can get started if you want to move in this direction. So one of those first, uh, and we would argue, and many do argue, the most important aspects of that best practice manual is to make walking safe and seamless. And it seems often when, you know, for us being cycling advocates and talking a lot about cycling, uh, to talk about walking seems maybe strange, but uh, one of the things that becomes very stark when you walk around cities here is that when you're on foot, in many cases, you're given first priority over all other modes, uh, where in North America, often it's quite the reverse. So here we've juxtaposed, these are two streets within uh, Delft, uh, one of which is quite close to where we live on the top, <clears throat> where you see that continuous on the right hand side, you've got that continuous footpath. So at no point do the pedestrians have to enter into the car space. They're given priority, given space and cars crossing into this intersection know that they're in a new space and they need to behave differently because they might interact with people that are on foot or on bicycle. Uh, similarly, on the left hand side, 
that crossing, um, although it's not 100% clear, pedestrian crossings are prioritized. So uh, when we often travel through this space, cars have to stop and yield for pedestrians. And so this, they're given this priority uh, in space to, and that allows for more comfort in terms of moving around, uh, not in a vehicle. Whereas on the bottom two are two intersections from where we used to live in Vancouver, where the crosswalk of the left-hand side is crossing what is essentially a four-lane road, even though it's parking on both sides. And it's a long way to travel for a small child that would be coming from the school that's just to the right of where this image is taken. Uh, and it doesn't really give them that safe feeling they're having to enter into car space. There's no real indication aside from the zebra crossing that cars need to behave differently. Similarly, at the crossing on the right-hand side where pedestrians have to enter into car space, and this often puts pedestrians at a conflict uh, with motorists, which as we're probably all quite aware is not a very safe place to put somebody who is not in a vehicle themselves. Another, I think important point uh, is the importance of traffic management, traffic circulation. Uh, even when it comes to cycling, the, there's this saying that the Chad, that the most important part of the bike plan, of the mobility plan is the car plan. Uh, and they have very uh, simply and precisely created a hierarchy of streets here in the Netherlands. Every Dutch city uh, breaks their streets down into three categories, uh, the local access streets, the local distributor roads, and then uh, national through roads or, or motorways. Uh, and the, the street networks are designed to prevent uh, local traffic from filtering through the residential and commercial areas. Uh, it's almost immediately pushed to a distributor road on the perimeter of the city, uh, which has two uh, important benefits. One is, uh, again, preventing that through traffic from filtering through uh, and creating these unsafe conditions for the people walking and cycling on those streets. Uh, but it also creates this time competitiveness uh, for walking and cycling over the car. You can see in the top right corner uh, in Groningen, where they've implemented a similar traffic circulation plan, because in a car you have to push out to the perimeter of the city and circumnavigate the city uh, to get from A to B, uh, suddenly getting around on a bicycle becomes all the more time competitive. And this is one important point of why people cycle so much here in the Netherlands. It's not because they care about the environment. It's not because they're altruistic or, or care about their health. It's because cycling has been made faster than driving uh, in nine times out of 10 in terms of moving around the city. Uh, building on that, in those residential streets, in those access streets, um, a key aspect of how they've achieved safer context and made it better for uh, walking and cycling is designing for the speed that you want. And so using things like traffic psychology to manipulate how people in people navigate these streets, not just people in cars, people on bicycle as well, uh, it helps to slow car traffic and create a much safer environment on residential streets. And they do that through things like chicanes, by narrowing the streets, putting up bollards where necessary, speed tables. So when you're in a car, you're physically elevated into a different space, which forces drivers to slow down inherently, um, mostly because they don't want to damage their car. But as, at the same time, it helps as, a, as an added bonus to uh, create a safer environment. Um, you might be familiar that uh, many uh, Dutch streets are also built with cobbles or pavers. And that creates a vibration in the vehicle as well, which uh, inherently causes drivers to slow down because your car makes more noise the faster you go. So people think, oh, I'm going too fast. I need to slow down. So all of these are sort of tricks that are played by the traffic engineers to slow people down and move appropriately in a space. Uh, oftentimes deeming that if they have to put up, uh, <clears throat> although there is a, a sign saying the, the speed limit on the street on the bottom right there, if they have to put up a speed sign, it's not, it's deemed a failure and it's time to go back to the drawing board and rethink how do we design this space to make drivers behave the way we want them to behave. And then another uh, yeah, important point that came out of this experimentation phase was that uh, cities need to stop thinking about cycle routes uh, and building them one at a time without giving consideration to how they connect to one another and how they connect the various origins and destinations in the city. So after the high profile failures in Tilburg uh, and The Hague, uh, for the third demonstration project, the national government decided to go to Delft, which is where we're lucky enough to call home, uh, 
uh, and the strategy there uh, uh, at the municipal level, uh, they were doing a lot of innovative and experimental things was to look at the city as a whole uh, and then identify uh, the weak points across the city, identify the trips that people were taking, and more importantly, the trips that people weren't taking by bicycle and create not just one network, but actually three overlapping cycling networks across the city that would each cater to a different type of user and a different type of destination. So you have the larger grid, the red routes that are for more longer distance journeys. Blue is kind of a mid-size, uh, mid-distance grid. And then the green is the really fine-grained routes uh, for movement within your neighborhood, perhaps to the school or the corner store. So for, by providing these three overlapping routes, uh, they're allowing journeys, not just from the house to the office uh, for that trip to work, but also uh, all those myriad other journeys that people were take, taking throughout the day, that is to uh, shops, schools, restaurants, uh, friends' houses, community centers, public transportation facilities, uh, and making it possible to cycle from anywhere to everywhere just by taking this holistic uh, network-based approach. And this is uh, out of this process has come the, the Crow Manual for uh, Bicycle Design. Uh, uh, and uh, there are five principles of network design that we now take to cities around the world. Uh, that is that a cycling network has to check five boxes. It has to be safe, comfortable, attractive, cohesive, and direct. <laughs> and, uh, and if you check all five of those boxes, then you can uh, expect great results. Um, an important part within that network, um, and it's something that is integral to this Dutch design and also applying sustainable safety to the network as well, is to never forget the weakest link. And oftentimes, when we're working with cities, um, intersections are deemed very, very difficult and often left out of the equation, when in fact they should be probably where we're starting, because intersections are where we have the most frequent opportunities for collisions, for conflicts between road users. And so in the Dutch design principles, <clears throat> looking at intersections and creating roundabouts like you see on the left or um, fully protected intersections like you see on the right, allow uh, priority for vulnerable road users in their design. So they force drivers to um, slow down when they're taking a turn, for example. Uh, they have the meeting at uh, vulnerable road users at almost a per perpendicular angle. So they're forced to acknowledge if someone is coming from the right to the left in terms of cycling, cyclists, in terms of pedestrians. Um, and all, all told, the behavior together helps to make for a much uh, smoother environment for people. Uh, and also in terms of that design, the intersection when someone is driving through an intersection, for example, or going through a roundabout, they're going to meet the cyclist first and the pedestrian second. So the most vulnerable in that environment is the most protected in that space. And these are all, like, there's a bunch of little details, mid-block crossings uh, and so on and so forth, but they all come together to create a really safe way to navigate what is often the most dangerous in many cities and should never be forgotten when we're talking about building out uh, sustainable transportation networks. Okay. And then this has been a more recent development here in the Netherlands, uh, and it was almost stumbled upon by accident. Planners started noticing uh, the piles uh, and, and seas of bicycles at the bus and train stations was this uh, encouragement of multimodal uh, travel, that is hopping from the bicycle to the train, tram or bus, and then back on a bicycle again to provide this door-to-door -door seamless uh, car competitor uh, with the understanding that the bicycle doesn't have the same range as the car, uh, public transportation doesn't have the same door-to-door uh, -door convenience, but when we combine these two modes, uh, we can capture more uh, passengers and feed them into the public transportation system um, and on the other end of the journey, give them a, a rental or a sharing uh, bike on the other end of their journey, we're able to provide that same door-to-door -door conveniences for distances much longer than three to five kilometers that people would cycle. Uh, this is the motor transport I get to work every day. It's a 70 kilometer journey uh, by cycling to the train station here in Delft, taking the, the train from Delft to Utrecht, and then borrowing uh, a public transport bike, the blue and yellow bikes in the bottom right corner with the same tap of the public transport card uh, to get to my final de destination. And this is 
Uh, why you see now, you know, uh, thousands and thousands of bike parking spaces at the train stations here in the Netherlands uh, is to provide that, that seamless journey, not by putting the bicycles on the public transportation uh, itself. We don't have uh, enough capacity uh, and, or, and it affects the scalability of the system, um, but by providing secure parking at the first mile uh, and a, a rental bike uh, on the last mile. But if you live too, just that little bit too far away from transit, uh, e-bikes have been exploding here for the better part of a decade uh, and continue to explode in terms of usage, uh, particularly for, for people over the age of 65, as it helps to extend the range that they're able to cycle. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard stories of people cycling well into their 80s and 90s. Um, <clears throat> but we also see young people. So, you know, although the Netherlands is a very dense country, uh, there are still villages that maybe aren't as well connected with public transport as, say, Delft or other uh, small and mid-sized cities. But by having e-bikes, uh, e-bikes is an option. Teenagers can get to high school. People can get to their jobs. They can connect with public transport if they're a little bit further out to get to uh, their final destination. And so part of building out these robust cycling networks is, by, is about creating space to allow for these mobility choices. Uh, to give people greater range, to allow them not to move faster, but to move further. And that's what we often hear in terms of the statistics is people aren't moving faster because of e-bikes. They're just being able to ride a little bit longer, removing sweat from the equation or any extra strain, but still enabling uh, mobility for as many people as possible. But that would never work here is the thing we often hear and continue to hear when we start talking about uh, what the Netherlands has accomplished. Um, but, you know, in response to that, there's so many different ways to respond to that. Um, this is a great example that we like to use here in Delft, the Market Square, which is the kind of living room of the city where we will celebrate King's Day tomorrow with thousands and thousands of other Delphites, was a surface parking lot. And it was only as recently as 2004 uh, that local politicians came up with a plan to remove that parking uh, and give part of it over to the local restaurants for terrace space uh, and the rest of it over to the city members. But uh, the Netherlands continues to strive to do better even in recent years. Uh, and we now have enough examples of other cities around the world uh, that are applying these principles uh, and learning from best practice from the Netherlands. What we do in our day jobs uh, is to help them understand what's not, uh, a, it's not a copy paste, but it is uh, a translation, a transferability uh issue and uh we're going to go through i guess two or three examples from our first book uh of cities uh in in canada and the united states that have uh accomplished similar things and are on their own way to becoming uh cycling cities of their own in their own right so it seems appropriate to start with where we came from <laughs> where we cut our cycling advocacy teeth as you will uh, in the city of Vancouver. And the reason we highlight Vancouver is in part because we had the personal experience of living there through the investments over the course of 10 years in cycling that continue now uh, to build out a cycling network that started in the downtown and building out from there. Um, but this was all because of political bravery. And that's why the story is so important is we often get asked, what is it? what do cities need to do uh, to become cycling cities? Where does that change need to come from? And although it is a combination of things like advocacy uh, and pushing from grassroots organizations, it is also about having politicians that are willing to put their neck on the line. As uh, the mayor of Vancouver, Gregor Robertson, did, he was elected in 2007 seven, <laughs> uh, uh, with on a mandate of building out cycling and was reelected continuously as he built, kept building upon this momentum that ended up building out uh, cycling networks that not only worked for our family, but for other families, uh, connecting east to west and north to south, uh, and is a continued improvement uh, even to this day, even though he has stepped down as mayor, there is uh, new leadership that is continuing to push forward, understanding that a city um, <clears throat> that works for everyone is one that invests in cycling uh, and connecting uh, all neighborhoods to each other. And then right across uh, the Rocky Mountains from Vancouver in Calgary, uh, I think they were watching quite closely what was happening in Vancouver, saw what, uh, what Gregor Robertson and others had accomplished in a decade, and they thought, 
maybe we can do that in a much shorter time period. So they uh, quite uh, ingeniously uh, came up with the idea of creating not just one cycle track or, or ripping off the proverbial band-aid and doing this one cycle track at a time, but creating a minimum grid of cycle tracks, an entire network that would be installed overnight uh, using very light, quick, cheap materials uh, to get uh, the local community and local councillors on board. They pitched this as a pilot project. That is, we will put it in for 18 months. We will measure it. We will uh, adjust and adapt it as people use it. And if people don't use it, or if it impacts car traffic uh, too heavily, if it's deemed a failure after those 18 months, uh, we'll rip it out, no harm, no foul, and go back to uh, what we had before. And uh, as you can imagine, people flock to uh, the, this new mode of transportation that was suddenly unlocked in the city, uh, even in the winter months, even in minus 21 degrees Celsius, as it was when we were there. We've seen it for ourselves. <laughs> uh, a, couple, a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, yeah, the statistics were quite staggering. 1.3 million new bicycle journeys were induced over this 18 month period simply by reallocating two to three percent of the uh, downtown road space for four to five million dollars, which is the rounding error on a, a, on a highway project. Uh, it actually came in uh, under budget and on time, a little bit early, actually. You can't say that about a lot of transportation projects. Uh, and has now formed the core of that city's uh, sustainable transportation network as it connects it cycling to the light rail uh, and builds this out from the city center into the suburbs. So it's proof that you don't have to take uh, a decade to do this. You can, uh, with the right strategy in place, do it overnight. Oh, sorry. Got it. <laughs> and the final city that we um, looked at, and we also looked at it in uh, building a cycling city, is the city of Austin, Texas. Um, where rather than looking at uh, connecting necessarily the downtown core or looking at um, broader sort of <clears throat> more central uh, cycling networks, they actually looked at the short car journeys, the, the journeys that many of us take uh, to, let's say, go to the store or uh, to stop, stop by a local community center. These trips under five kilometers or so that don't necessarily need to be done in car would be just as easily facilitated if done by bicycle when provided the space to do so. So the city of Austin, working with the Dutch Cycling Embassy, did a Think Bike workshop back in 2014, 12. 2012, um, <clears throat> where they did an assessment of the trips that people were taking, captured those short car journeys, and then developed a network based on that, uh, which is what you can see on the screen in front of you, some of the, the routes that were developed all with a mind of connecting people from their residences to uh, shopping distance, shopping centers within that five kilometer distance to schools, uh, to community centers, to any sort of amenities that could be reached comfortably by bicycle by as many people as possible. Uh, and now 10 years on are starting to realize that network and really see the numbers uh, change in terms of who's using uh, walking and cycling to get around just by creating a little bit of road space or carving a little bit of road space out for cycling uh, and making it a little bit safer for those moving on foot and by bicycle. So that brings us to uh, the current uh, pandemic situation. Uh, the past two years, as, as everybody knows, have been really devastating on a lot of people's lives <laughs> and livelihoods, um, but there has been one silver lining in that it has really challenge cities to look at the way they allocate space on their streets uh, and to look at how resilient and reliable their mobility networks are. Uh, and as a result, we've seen uh, sometimes decades of progress made in uh, weeks uh, in a lot of cities. And we're going to talk a little bit about why that came to be uh, and how that what how that's shown us what's possible uh, coming out of this pandemic in terms of perhaps thinking uh, about our, our streetscapes a little bit differently. So as many of you have, had probably seen on the news or maybe even experienced in your own communities, the first phase uh, after the initial lockdown from COVID was to start investing in slow streets. There was this recognition that um, with people being locked down and with the, the mandates for physical distancing, the impacts on physical and mental health uh, by not being able to move around our cities was far greater than um, our, our systems could handle. 
And so by creating these slow streets, we gave people the opportunity to get out and go for a bike ride, to walk in a physically distanced way from their neighbors uh, without having to worry about whether the sidewalk was too narrow, for example, they could step onto the street to give each other space. Children could get outside with their parents and really experience uh, the city or their neighborhood outdoors, even in this really uh, safe sort of experience way by being uh, safely distant from each other. And so this became the first sort of recognition that our streets can be treated a little bit differently. Even our neighborhood streets can, can be <clears throat> reorganized in a way that allows for us to get outside without having to give all of that space over to cars. And then as cities started coming out of lockdown in, uh, I guess it was uh, the spring of, of 2020, they were faced with a very real uh, geometry problem. That is with social distancing requirements, with um, the lost attractiveness of public transportation, people were afraid of contracting COVID uh, on trams, buses and trains. Uh, that suddenly there was a gap in their mobility systems. Uh, that is, uh, and in London, it was perhaps the most dramatic example that resulted to about 8 million journeys per day uh, that were lost on, on the public transportation system that had to be made up by other means of transportation. Uh, and if just a fraction of those people uh, hopped into their cars on top of existing uh, traffic, the, the impact on the streets and the, the people living on those streets would be tremendous in terms of the congestion, the pollution, uh, the, the lost uh, freight and delivery times. Um, there was a, a real cost to uh, not acting uh, and, and making change. And the, they quantified that 8 million journeys per day, uh, they would have to, to make up for that lost capacity, uh, create a tenfold increase in, in miles cycled and a fivefold increase in miles walked, which is why you saw a lot of cities uh, scrambling to take temporary, create temporary infrastructure uh, to, to make up for that gap in their capacity. That was perhaps best quantified by uh, an Amsterdam-based research organization called the CISIO. They're part of the Dutch Cycling Embassy, uh, and we, we promote their work internationally. But they were hired by the national government in Italy to look at three different scenarios coming out of lockdown. That is, don't do anything and just allow uh, those people to hop in their cars on top of existing traffic. Uh, a, a mild intervention in terms of creating some space for walking and cycling to shift some of those journeys to active means, and then a really dramatic inter intervention in terms of reallocating budget uh, and space uh, and allowing trips of up to 10 kilometers by walking and e-cycling uh, within cities in Italy. And the, the cost to society in terms of doing nothing was tremendous. It was estimated at being at least 15 billion euros nationally. Uh, and the cost, or, or shall we say the savings of uh, intervening far outweighed uh, the, the, uh, the euros that would have to be invented, uh, invested to create uh, this infrastructure, savings of anywhere from five to almost 20 billion euros, savings to society in terms of public health, reduced congestion, uh, air and noise pollution, uh, creating greater or just better cities in which to live uh, would end up saving the cities. And, and again, this is why uh, in Italy, especially, you saw a, a lot of changes to the streetscapes uh, as cities came out of lockdown. It was all about saving money in the long term. So as Chris mentioned, many cities in the second phase uh, following the, the lockdown and a bit of the reopening in 2020 was to build out pop-up networks, uh, specifically for cycling. Uh, one of those uh, that I got to work on the guidebook for was in the city of Berlin, where <clears throat> they invested in, in reallocating road space for these temporary cycle networks uh, in, a, in a way or in, with a mind to creating space for essential workers to uh, access their jobs without having to rely on public transport. And so uh, like Berlin, you saw similar measures in Lisbon, very familiar with what they've been doing in Paris, in London. Uh, we saw countless uh, examples throughout North America as well, where they were building these pop-up lanes to help keep people moving uh, post-lockdown. And what this really does is help to show what is possible. And we often talk with like, the example of Calgary, of these temporary networks becoming the proof that if we reallocate road space, things will be okay and you will shift new journeys. 
to cycling and ultimately create a safer environment for walking as well. Uh, so it becomes this really great example of what is possible for how people move. And then at the same time, it becomes possible to show people a different way of experiencing stay in our cities as well. So when we couldn't be eating indoors, many cities, New York, uh, I think the picture on the top right is from, or top left, sorry, is from Los Angeles, even here in Rotterdam in the Netherlands, uh, pop-up patios became a very common phenomenon as a way to not only create an outdoor space for people to enjoy uh, their cities together, to have a coffee, to be social, but also to help reinvest back into the economy for these businesses that really struggled during lockdown when they weren't able to open and, and have a customer base. Um, so it becomes this, it really became an opportunity uh, for a lot of businesses and for the city itself to show that our streets aren't necessarily meant for moving cars. They can be a space that can be reallocated for staying and enjoying our city in a very social and connected way. Um, and then as cities, yeah, as cities uh, not only come out of lockdown, but start looking ahead uh, past the COVID crisis to, uh, unfortunately, uh, the crisis that we have on the horizon, that is the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis, uh, future pandemics, uh, oil and resource shortages. Um, cycling has become a central role in the strategies that they're putting together toward looking towards an economic recovery. Uh, in a Green New Deal in the United States and, and in Europe, um, creating cycling networks as a response uh, to these crises and creating a more resilient city uh, in the face of those crises. Uh, cycling is uh, a great economic tool in terms of creating attractive areas for people to live, work, shop, um, and also creating cycling infrastructure creates uh, a lot of jobs. So um we're seeing now uh cycling isn't just uh, a nice to have for a lot of these cities around the world it is indeed uh a need to have with the understanding that electric cars are still uh cars uh, and they're still uh, part of this fragile system that is susceptible to outside shock and interference in the in the face of crisis so we find ourselves now is that this this uh, a bit of a turning point at a global scale uh, in terms of changing potentially how we move in our cities, how we treat our cities, how we develop our cities. Um, and one of the things that we learned about in researching the second book, Curbing Traffic, when speaking to uh, Dr. Judith Yang, I got that right? Wang. Wang. <laughs> YT Wang. <laughs> Um, is the idea of ecological resilience. And what that means is that there's only so much strain a system can take before it needs to switch uh, to a new stability regime. Uh, if we think way, way back before humans roamed the earth, we saw similar things with the ice age in terms of how the planet readjusted itself. And so now where we find ourselves in terms of what we can do is potentially changing that script again. We have lived in a very car dominant uh, society for the last hundred years or so, but it doesn't mean that we're stuck this way. The system can only take so much. And at some point we need to think about how we can cross that threshold and create a new stability regime, one that enables more sustainable transport options that allow us to address the climate crisis while also addressing uh, issues with equity and transport uh, and availability and access for people. And so that leads us into this next section where we'll talk about some of the reasons why uh, making these investments are part of creating a more equitable transport landscape. But first, <laughs> before we talk about equity, yeah, I think uh, there's two important points uh, that came out of uh, the Netherlands uh, five decade uh, of, of building safer streets and the response to that road safety crisis in the 1970s. The first, of course, is uh, actual success when it comes to reducing the number of fatalities and serious injuries on their streets. There's been a continuous decline since that uh, that movement started in the 1970s with an understanding that we have to build forgiving environments uh, and road safety is an engineering thing, uh, an engineering problem. It's not an enforcement or education problem. Uh, by building safe systems uh, and safe environments, uh, the Netherlands has become one of the safest places on the planet to walk uh, and cycle. Uh, Canada's uh, not quite as bad as the United States. It's somewhere in between 
uh, the Netherlands and the United States, but it's still about fivefold uh, worse than it is here in the Netherlands per kilometer walked and per kilometer cycled. And at this point, it's always important for us to point out that we are not saying cars don't have their role in how we move through our cities. There will always be the necessity for having motorized or electrified transport uh, for freight, for people movement. Um, and one of the things that we think is important to remember is that by making these investments in sustainable transportation, by making it easier to walk and cycle for the journeys that make sense or combine with public transport where possible, the Netherlands is actually one of the uh, nicest places in the world to drive a car because the trips that people don't need to take by, uh, by car that they can do by these other modes helps to free up road space for the trips that people do need to take uh, by car, by, by freight, by otherwise uh, motorized or electrified transport. So it seems counterintuitive, but in creating more space for walking and cycling, we, they've <coughs> inadvertently created greater uh, environments in terms of moving around by motorized or electrified large transport. All right, and now we will <laughs> end on the topic of equity because uh, this is really yeah why this this is so important uh, with the understanding that the people currently cycling in your city uh, are not the ones that we're actually building this infrastructure for, and that if you do get your network planning, your intersection design, your traffic calming right, uh, then suddenly you unlock cycling as a mode of transportation for other segments of society that aren't currently cycling, but are also excluded from a car dominated transportation system. It begins with childhood, the first 16 years of our lives, we do not have a driver's license. Um, some people often forget that. Uh, and uh, we're dependent on our parents to get us around. Uh, but one thing you really notice when you come to cities here in the Netherlands is that the cycling infrastructure unlocks uh, a freedom and independence that most children in the world don't have. Uh, as young as eight, nine years old, uh, you can cycle by yourself uh, in a Dutch city and, and feel pretty comfortable and safe doing so. We saw it firsthand moving with our children here uh, that suddenly they were just cycling to school uh, here in Delft. They were cycling to the swimming pool in neighboring cities, friends' houses all over the place, even riding the train system to other cities uh, in the Netherlands. When you have other options in the car, uh, then suddenly children can grow up outside of the supervision of their parents, outside the watchful eye of their parents, outside of the back seat of their parents' car, uh, and they can suddenly experience their world, get to know their neighbors, get to know their neighborhood, uh, make mistakes, uh, learn from those mistakes, and become much more balanced, uh, resilient, and independent young adults. And this is, uh, for us, one of the, the reasons we moved to the Netherlands, uh, one of the things that keeps us motivated to make these changes in other cities. Uh, <clears throat> one of the other things that happens when we create these investments in sustainable transport is we create a more feminist city uh, or a, a city that works better for women. Um, car dominated transport systems have been developed for the last hundred years or so uh, from the ethos that began with male planners planning for the trips that they take. Uh, not from a place necessarily of ill will, but rather when we're designing our cities, we design them, we plan them in a way that is informed by our lived experience. And because of this male domination, a more male dominated uh, field up until more recent years, our transport systems sort of are built, have been built that way. But when we take into account short trips that people take that are still predominantly done by women, by incorporating it with public transportation, by thinking about how our walking networks connect people to schools, to services, to the care work that's done by women, we create a much more gender equitable city. Uh, and it's been our experience and my experience in particular in moving here that um, trips that I would normally have to go out of my way to take on my trip home from work, for example, to pick up something for dinner or pick up the kids before uh, coming home, for the evening are much more easily facilitated by that network design we talked about earlier, connecting people from where they need to get to to where they want to get to by in, uh, embedding safety into the networks and making sure that uh, you have the traffic comp streets mixed with separation where necessary uh, and really creating an environment where 
it's much more uh, intuitive to get around has created a much more feminist, uh, a gender equal way of getting around the city. And so we, we argue that although the, it wasn't the intent of designers and planners here in the Netherlands to create these very uh, uh, women friendly or care trip friendly networks, uh, the byproduct of that has meant that the number of women you see cycling through the Netherlands of varying backgrounds and economic means means that the cities have worked for women and continue to work for women to allow them to experience the city on an equal footing to their male or uh, non-binary counterparts. And then when you start talking about reducing car dependence, car dominance, car access, um, one of the first pushbacks we always get is, well, what about people with disabilities? Don't they rely on a car? Uh, and these arguments are sometimes made in good faith, but often made in bad faith. People with disabilities are weaponized in this conversation. Uh, and we often just make the point of asking them. Um, and the, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, you will see people of all ages and abilities uh, using the, the streets and the cycling infrastructure here because uh, it's been made inclusive and it's been made intuitive, uh, not necessarily on a two-wheeled bicycle, but a, perhaps on a three-wheeled bicycle, on a hand cycle, an adapted cycle of some kind, or a wheelchair or a motorized wheelchair, as you see in the top right corner. Um, that's all made possible through uh, the street design and the, the network-based approach that allows people uh, to continue to participate in society. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, you know, people with disabilities are not an amorphous blob. Uh, they are uh, each have their own individual uh, wants and needs. Uh, and uh, the statistics coming out of a lot of different countries are that a lot of them don't have the physical or financial needs to drive a car. Uh, often it requires adapting the car uh, that costs a lot of money or they don't want to be completely dependent on the car. Uh, and so by providing them with uh, an alternative that is not, again, banning cars or, or removing cars from the equation, uh, we can give them a more uh, uh, economic means and uh, independent means to continue uh, to, to go on with their daily lives. And finally, we start with childhood and we end with our senior years. Um, <clears throat> by creating these um, equitable environments for moving around, be it on foot, on bicycle, on tricycle, on adapted uh, wheelchair, on mobility scooter. Uh, the cities around that we have experienced since moving here have really enabled people to cycle well into their old age and to remain a part of the social network and social fabric that is the cities where they may have grown up, as the case was with our friend Peter, who's in the bottom right hand there. Uh, or places that they've moved to and decided to retire. They can maintain contact, be it with friends, with, um, with family, have that, those opportunities to be around uh, other people simply by creating these environments that allow them uh, to participate in society and be a part of society. And so when we look at our cities, not as places that need to move cars around, but rather are places for people to move and to spend time and, and connect with others, uh, then we create a really age-friendly city, allowing um, people to age in place without having to worry about being institutionalized or having to be dependent on family members or friends to get them around the city. Uh, and really um, allowing for that autonomy that they developed as children to extend well into old age uh, for as long as they, they wish it so. So with that, um, we will, uh, as we often do, end our presentation with a, an existential question. This uh, image on the left is not a parody. Uh, it's not the onion. It's a very real proposal from the Peloton Corporation uh, to encourage commuters to get some exercise uh, on their way to the office. Um, but in all seriousness, with the, the rise of uh, autonomous electric uh, and maybe even flying cars, we do run the risk of, uh, especially coming out of the pandemic with this trend of the car being seen as a safe space, a safe bubble, a piece of personal protective equipment, uh, on doubling down to the mistakes of the 20th century and continuing to build cities and infrastructure that are not accessible to uh, everyone that lives in the city and, and result in these pretty hostile uh, and, and uh, unpleasant cities to live. So we would argue 
uh, that we should be looking more to the right. Uh, that's a photo of our children cycling in Amsterdam. It's not uh, one or the other, but but perhaps we can take inspiration from that uh, and, and avoid uh, the mistakes, uh, doubling down on those mistakes and, and continuing down this, this dead end road to uh, automobility. So with that, we've come to the end. Uh, we will again plug our two books. The first, Building the Cycling City, the Dutch Blueprint for Urban Vitality, was released in 2018 uh, by Island Press and has a few more of those case studies like what we spoke about earlier with the cases of Vancouver, Calgary, and Austin of North American cities that are taking ideas from the Netherlands and applying them on their own streets in context, uh, showing that it is indeed possible and curbing traffic, the human case for fewer cars in our lives where we look more at uh, the social, uh, physical and mental health benefits of cities that are less dominated by cars. Uh, we would also take this opportunity to plug Biblioasis who brought the books in. If you wish to purchase a copy, you can buy local. Um, but if you are not local to Windsor uh, and uh, perhaps not close enough for them to ship to, you can purchase uh, these books wherever you buy your books. We often say buy local whenever possible, um, but you know, if you're interested, pick it up wherever you can. Um, with that, then we come to the end of our presentation uh, and I, we will be here to answer questions that may have come up throughout the talk. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for, for all of that, um, Melissa and Chris. And I think that the number of questions that you see flooding in is an indication of just how meaningful this, this presentation has been for, for so many of us. So thank you very much. Um, and I'll just note on the Biblio Oasis front as well um, that I'm happy to be able to announce that Biblio Oasis is offering a 20% discount um, on both of your books in, in connection with, um, with the events today and in collaboration with your publisher. So um, for those again who are local, please do go to Biblio Oasis. Uh, there was a question about whether they would be available at the Sandwich Brewing Company, company tonight. I don't believe so, um, but Biblio Oasis is a beautiful bookstore located in a lovely neighborhood in Windsor and Rockville. Um, so hopefully you'll have a chance to, to check it out there and they will have those books uh, at that discount for the next couple of weeks at least. Um, we have about 25 minutes left for questions. I have been up, upping the questions as they arrive. Um, I know it indicates that we'll get to all of them. We won't get to all of them, but I did want to make sure that everyone is able to see them. Uh, and so we'll, we'll do our best to get through some. Um, I would, however, like to open our question and answer um, with a couple of questions um, and with the focus on youth and in particular, uh, thinking about, about being able to um, build a city that our, that our youth can benefit from. Um, I want to turn the floor, first of all, uh, to Jana Jandal al Rufai. Jana is a first year University of Windsor student uh, and the pre current president of the Windsor Essex Youth Climate Council. Uh, so Jana, I'm going to give the floor to you and because we missed you at the beginning, I'm happy to, to give you just a minute to say a word about the Climate Council as well and to ask your question. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, first off, thank you for this great event. It's been very informative and I've enjoyed it very much. Um, so the Windsor Essex Youth Climate Council, uh, it's a climate council here um, in Windsor, we try to focus on youth advocacy, especially when it comes to climate. And we've been working a lot on cycling and transportation. Um, and as youth, we, you know, we understand um, that this is a great thing. Uh, accessible cities, cycling cities um, are the future. Uh, but it's been very difficult to get other adults to want to engage in that. Um, it's easier for things to stay the same. Um, and you talked about how like the roads were influencing people's behaviors, their speeds, what modes of transportation they used, but how do we make people want to push for that influence in the first place? Um, how do we start changing the car culture? That's an excellent question. Uh, and one that we can attest many cities, not just in North America, but in Europe as well and elsewhere in the world struggle with. Um, I think the first point that we would make there is that, and it's, it's a challenge, but in terms of engagement, in terms of outreach, um, it's important not to be dissuaded by the loudest voices in the room, because oftentimes the loudest voices in the room are not representative of the majority of the people around you. And so what we often find in terms of um, engagement, in terms of research is that people generally are in favor of these changes. They just need to understand them uh, and they just need to be heard. And <clears throat> I think that's the biggest challenge is the being heard. 
uh, because when we're talking about you know town council meetings for example or engagement sessions they don't always happen where people are at or at the times that they need and so making that space to reach out to groups where they're at be it going to local community centers and and more underrepresented uh, areas of the city or um, having conversations with people that um, maybe can't make it out to these, you know, town council meetings or, or aren't not commenting in the paper. Um, it's hard to find, not necessarily hard to find them, they are there, but just it really comes to meeting where they're at. And then you can maybe start to find your allies um, that maybe were hidden before, um, looking at healthcare, or, yeah, health health groups, people focus on healthcare, tend to be very much in favor of these. Uh, finding school groups, uh, be, uh, you know, both primary and secondary school groups that are interested in creating safer walk walking routes to school, finding those advocates and then building that voice, I think is a good, a good place to start, to start shifting the conversation from the naysayers, the very loud voices in the room to the, those people that maybe uh, haven't had the opportunity yet to tell them, to share their story and, and their needs. Yeah, I think one of the lessons we uh, we learned in researching uh, the political movements in the 1970s was it wasn't just one issue that moved the needle. It was this really broad consensus uh, of from the environmentalists to the families to the historical preservationists, the anarchists, the public health associations. <laughs> they all didn't know they were fighting for the same thing, but they were all fighting for a more livable city kind of accidentally. Uh, and if we can find those allies across the political spectrum from both the left and right, uh, I think we can we can find some pretty uh, solid common ground. Uh, everyone might would probably agree that we should provide children with a safe environment to walk or cycle to school, for example. Not many people would say they're in disagreement with that, um, but it is finding those allies uh, and amplifying their voices and, and as Melissa said, not making sure that that the, the noisy minority that has the most power, influence, and time, uh, time <laughs> and, and probably the most mobility isn't stopping other people from achieving uh, what they want and, and uh, drowning out uh, what we would argue is a, a, a quieter majority. Thank you so much for an answer. And, and I'll just say to you that that question echoes much of what I'm seeing in the Q&A as well. So I think you touched on several several um, questions there. Um, Jess, do you have a question that you'd like to ask on behalf of Activate Transit Windsor Essex? Yes, yeah, so, um, you know, I just did a couple comments on the presentation, you know, I thought it was uh, excellent, especially, you know, covering how to use bikes to fill transit. Uh, that's you know something that I um, I am a, a new mom of two. So um, before babies, you know, car free travel was uh, a lot easier to sort of just think about. Uh, and here in Windsor, it takes a lot of time to sort of plan that out. So as we move forward, um, and you know, as I look to advocate in my city, um, what do you think is some key infrastructure that we should be pushing for to support families, to support people of all ages, uh, to be able to get across the city? That's another excellent question, and <laughs> not an easy one. But um, I mean, I think we we need to recognize that it's it's not one mode to rule them all. And you know, if people are attempting to live car free, and we did the same with young children in Vancouver, there needs to be options, and they need to be well connected to make it realistic. Because we're it's no one's going to change their habits in terms of how they move through the city if we make it a challenge. Um, there might be people like perhaps yourself, Jess, or, or us, that will go out of our way to make it a little more difficult to, to do, to be the example. But if we want more people to be walking, cycling, and taking public transport, we need to create networks that connect people to where they need to be, uh, which gets a bit challenging with public transport. It is historically underfunded in most cities, but speaking to public transport agencies so they understand where people are and where they need to get to and what types of trips need to be facilitated, not just within uh, the normal nine to five rush hours. So looking at access, that access to opportunity, it's, it's not just per se for families, but for people working shift work, for people working odd hours, ensuring that that is an option for them so they don't lose that access. 
And then from there, looking at where does the cycling network, where is the cycling network and how does it connect? Where are walking networks and how do they connect with public transport or with amenities to make, uh, make trips easier for families so that they don't have to rely on a car for every trip? Uh, and then one of the reasons that we were able to live car free in Vancouver is investing in car car share as well, so that the trips you have to take by car, you have that choice, um, but you don't have to have the burden of car ownership that goes along with it. Yeah, I would just echo that that idea. Of it, I mean, it feels like redundancies creating these overlapping systems that provide the same purpose. But it, it's through that choice that you have the freedom to choose the mode that works for that particular journey. And we, as when we lived in Vancouver in particular, would find ourselves choosing between yeah the bus or the car share or the bicycle, depending on the we what the weather was doing, what we happened to be carrying, uh, yeah, which which children were accompanying us that day, uh, and and but we had that that freedom of choice and I think in far too many places mm -hmm. uh, it's it's one or two modes or, or nothing yeah um, the cycling infrastructure um, you suddenly look at it a different way when you're cycling with children and I think this is unfortunately something that a lot of uh, designers engineers planners don't have that perspective is um, how would you cycle with your child probably side by side so suddenly width really matters uh and uh and the perception of safety changes completely uh as well so uh maybe it is uh um having more families not just at the planning table but actually making the decisions themselves mm -hmm. rather than um the old pale stale male <laughs> uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> tribe that's still still unfortunately <laughs> making most of the decisions yeah i think the only thing i would uh, add to that is um, we talk a lot about options, but it's being it's being mindful that those options aren't just adding options to the people that already have all of the options. Um, so, you know, looking at the neighborhoods that are are least served by a variety of mobility choices, and then making sure that the investments are put in those communities. Um, because, you know, we look at, for example, uh, e-scooter share or sometimes car share. They're often in these environments where people already have a car or already have ample transport options and have the economic means to choose whatever transport option that they want when it's the the people living in lower income communities or people that are living uh, in transport poverty transport poor uh, areas where we need to be putting more investment so that we can create a more uh, inclusive and equitable transport system we have 51 questions we better yeah <laughs> sorry <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to I'm going to pull together three or four of them in, in, in make an attempt here. So um, thanks so much for all of that. Um, and I want to I want to pull out a couple of questions um, that come actually from the current chair of the Windsor Cycling Bicycling Committee, which is a, a committee of, of, of the municipal government of council and uh, and also from the former chair. Uh, of that committee, and uh, and I also do, doing so recognize that we have several councillor elected councillors from Windsor in the audience today, um, as well as the acting chief of police or Windsor Police. So um, I sort of ask, ask those questions in this context. Um, the questions are related to sort of policy and 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 the sort of decision making side of things, um, as well as enforcement. I might be stretching in terms of bringing these together, but I'll throw them out, out at you in any case. Um, first of all, uh, questions about life cycle maintenance. So not only the capital costs associated with, with the actual creation of the infrastructure, but then thinking about how you how municipalities have met the challenge of not only allocating those dollars up front, but creating to create the robust cycling networks we need, but also the ongoing challenge of maintaining that infrastructure once it's done. Uh, so I'm going to throw that at you, and I'm going to add um, two other pieces to that. One is thinking about the police side, the, uh, both from a policy and enforcement side, what, what has been the example of the Netherlands in terms of the role of the police on enforcement and how has that helped to, to create a, a cycling city or a cycling friendly culture within, within cities? Um, and then third, I see several comments related to, to that about uh, about theft um, and, and infrastructure to prevent theft. And I think there's an enforcement piece there as well. So I'm gonna throw all of that out at you and kind of give you a few minutes to, to comment on any or all of it. Yeah. I'll talk about theft, I think, to start, because <laughs> that's the easy one. <laughs> um, theft is definitely a, a huge problem here. We've already had two bikes stolen in the three years that we've lived here. Um, but 
for the most part, the bicycles people ride are inexpensive and easily replaceable. That's changing, of course, with the, the introduction of e-bikes is suddenly people are using two, three, 4,000 euro units and a little more hesitant to leave them on the street. And that becomes uh, the, all the more reason to focus on bike parking and bike parking was something that the city of Vancouver largely ignored, unfortunately, as part of their infrastructure networks. And we were arguing regularly that parking is infrastructure. Every bike ride starts and ends with a, a parking space. Uh, and without parking, you have no uh, bicycle. Uh, so the, uh, the Netherlands, yeah, they have these tremendous secure facilities, not only at the train stations, but in the city center, so that you know that where you leave your bike uh, it's in a guarded uh, facility that's well lit with security cameras, uh, and it's going to be there at the end of the day uh, when you come back to your bicycle. Um, so we would emphasize that, yes, it, it, parking, I mean, theft here is a problem you're never actually going to solve. It's uh, something... The more bicycles there are, the more theft there seems yeah. to be. Yeah. But you can alleviate people's concerns <laughs> about theft, and that is, becomes a reason why people don't ride as much or perhaps are hesitant to make a journey by bicycle, uh, that influenced their choice by giving them those end of trip facilities or start of trip facilities in their apartment building or or uh, housing complex that they're they're living in. Bike parking has to be really taken seriously uh, to to alleviate those concerns. Uh, in terms of policing, I, I mean, if this would be very very much anecdotal, but it, it's very. For the most part, it's quite hands off. So unless someone's being very dangerous in their actions, or um, you know, there happens to be, you know, in the winter time, for example, they'll be a little bit more mindful about making sure people have lights on their bikes. Um, but it's much more of a um, an, an education or a reminding people campaign as opposed to policing, um, which I think is is important uh, for a North American context because of. Uh, the types of people that might be riding bicycles or choosing bicycles to get around uh, policing might not be the way to encourage more people to get around by bike but if it's much more of a, a hands-off um, not completely hands-off approach but understanding that the harm for example if we're talking about road safety uh, or, or people behaving dangerously on a bicycle the damage that can be done by somebody on a bicycle is far less than somebody uh, moving at 60, 70 kilometers an hour on a street that's not meant for that in a car. Uh, so understanding where the priorities are and, and where that those efforts and that fund, that money uh, and time needs to be invested. One of perhaps one of the other <clears throat> things worth mentioning is a lot of the policing is actually done on a bicycle. Yeah. That is the police <laughs> are doing their patrols in the cities. Not exclusively. They do, of course, still have police cars. But uh, I think it, it, it makes them approachable. It makes them, uh, you know, visible in the community. Uh, and it also makes them empathetic to people, other people on bicycles, because they suddenly are seeing the world uh, um, over their handlebars and, and understanding that it's uh, uh, rather than through a windshield. And I think uh, perhaps in, in other places, one of the, the problems is that uh, uh, if the police see the world through the windshield, they suddenly see cyclists as uh, an other. Uh, and see them as a, a yeah a, a problem to be quote unquote uh, addressed rather than um, seeing them as an uh, ally in the street that uh, yeah can be nudged to make more responsible decisions. But in general, uh, and this is a, another thing, it always comes back to this idea of badly behaved cyclists. Cyclists are scoff laws that are always breaking the law. Well, they're doing so because. Uh, they're in a, a system that was designed to maximize the flow and speed of motor vehicles, uh, and they're just doing it out of self-preservation. And there's academic research that's been done that as the networks go in place and the infrastructure improves, the amount of rule breaking that's done by cyclists it reduces significantly because they're suddenly being given the dignity of space and traffic light timings that work for them uh, and not forced to come to a complete stop every intersection that they go through. And then the first, sorry, Annika, can you repeat the first part of the question with regards to policy? Because now I've forgotten. Maintenance. Uh, maintenance. It was the infrastructure, the, the, the ongoing yeah. capital, capital. Yeah. Well, I think it's the same. It's uh, here the approach is, is very similar to what most cities would do around road infrastructure, right? Is you you put the capital investment in to put it in in the first place, and then and I've forgotten the word 
uh, that I, I usually know, but then there's the understanding that they're over time, you still need to have that investment as part of your budget. It's just, uh, it's built into the, the maintenance. And the, yeah. the thing to remember is that cycling infrastructure has a much longer lifespan than road infrastructure. And so something that's built today, you know, 10 years from now might need a few upgrades, but isn't going to need the same kind of uh, reinvestment as, as roads do. Um, and there's trade-offs, yeah. right? Because um, fundamental to Dutch cycling infrastructure is the red asphalt that's used. Uh, whereas most other places in the world just put a coat of paint down that has to be replaced every two or three years. They're mixing uh, uh, pigment in the asphalt and laying that red uh, carpet down, if you will, two centimeter top layer of asphalt down that needs to be replaced every uh, decade or so, uh, rather than every two or three years. Um, outside of that, there's also, of course, winter maintenance, mm -hmm. maybe less so here in the Netherlands, you get snow once in a while, but in other uh, cities, uh, such as Montreal, they, they often stress um, they do have to allocate significant amounts of money to do, make sure they have the equipment and the staff available uh, to clear the cycling infrastructure because otherwise people won't use it uh, in the winter time and it becomes um, yeah a bit of a, a, a waste of space if you yeah. will if you're that not becomes, actually going to maintain it properly. Yeah it becomes a prioritization of budget so if you want to have an all-season cycling network and you know in a Canadian city understanding that snow will be part of that ice may be part of that then having the, the budget available uh, to in order to address that will allow people to continue cycling and we see it in you know in Montreal we see it in Ottawa we saw it in Calgary Winnipeg, uh, Finland, for example, <laughs> where they get a lot of snow, um, making sure that, that there's a prioritization of that investment uh, means that people don't have to put their bikes away in the winter and you have that continued uh, usage um, all year round. Thanks so much. I, I want to come back to a couple of questions here and, and I want to acknowledge one is coming from Gil Penalosa, who is uh, founder of 880 Cities, and I think a friend to many of us here. So um, Gil, thank you for being here. Um, 880 Cities also is, is a funder of, of, uh, of seed grant for Activate Transit Windsor-Essex, um, who are with us today. So um, thanks for that. And that question ties in with, with questions I see from others as well in the chat. Uh, and it's certainly something I think that's faced in Windsor, but in many other mid-sized cities. And since that's, that's part of our focus today, I think that's an appropriate place to come to, which is the question of how building a cycling city connects with land use patterns. Um, certainly in Ontario, I don't think it's any surprise that many, many smaller cities and mid-sized cities are continue to battle sprawl at, at a political level. Um, I would go so far as to say the province has not been very helpful on that in the, in the last few years. Um, so, uh, you know, how, how has that been an issue in the Netherlands or any, perhaps even more so given that you're working around the, around the world and including in Ontario elsewhere, um, what, are you, what lessons are you seeing from that? Um, how are the two, you know, the sort of land use, housing, densification, um, cycling city pieces coming together in, and where, I mean, what are the best practices that we can rely on there? Yeah, land use is always a really tricky one because uh, especially, you know, we grew up in Ontario, we're very familiar with the context there. When uh, land use is so focused on residential without that flexibility for allowing for uh, retail or, or services, it, it creates a challenge. Um, so uh, from that, cities need to be looking at what are those land use uh, and zoning rules and how can we adjust them to, <clears throat> to allow for more um, diversity in terms of, uh, you know, where retail or services are in location to these new residents, residential areas that we're building. Um, but I think, you know, and this comes back to it's not one solution for all. Like there are trips until we change those networks. There are trips that will be, need to be done uh, by car. But I think we look to Austin as the example of, of looking at those short trips um, because, you know, if we think about a five kilometer radius of a community, it is probably inevitable that somewhere in there will be the school, might be some healthcare services, a corner store. And so if we can start to facilitate those trips at a neighbor, neighborhood level, um, then, and that's what we see is that people will start to use uh, the means that makes the most sense for those shorter trips. I mean, I think the one thing that really amazes us, what we've seen firsthand here in the Netherlands is this um, spirit of collaboration and cooperation. And they've really broken down the silos between 
the various uh, channels of decision making. That is, urban planning decisions aren't made in isolation of the transport planning decisions, uh, and and so on and so forth. So when you come to building a brand new neighborhood, uh, as they doing right now to the north of Delft, the um, the schools are the first things to go on the ground, uh, and then the cycling infrastructure the roads and the traffic calming going next and the houses going last. And it's really, yeah, I think, uh, again, a more holistic approach rather than just slapping down a bunch of tract housing uh, to actually consider how these neighborhoods connect to uh, the schools, the shops uh, and the public transport facilities to ensure that the residents are connected to uh, the other parts of the, the region and the country uh, without locking them into car dependency right from day one of that neighborhood. Uh, so this this polder model that they talk about that you know began with the draining of the uh, the polders here uh, and has permeated in all channels of governance and decision making uh, is really something that uh, that other places should be looking at because uh, yeah it helps break down these silos and, and ensure that these these topics are addressed in a more holistic manner. I really appreciate that comment, and I think that's actually a good place for us to sort of be drawing to a, to a close. And, and in doing so, I want to just note as well, there's been a lot of conversation in, in Windsor-Essex in the last couple of weeks about uh, a, a renewed focus, I think, on active routes to school and seen, you know, talking about sort of breaking down silos, a lot of, a lot of work by the school boards and, and the city on that. Um, I'm hearing a lot of buzz from parents about that, and I think that that also ties into uh, to your comments, Melissa and Chris, about about this not being about every trip, right? This is about what are the trips that we, how can we build the infrastructure to allow some of those trips to go? Um, Windsor and a lot of other cities may never be entirely car free, um, and that's probably not the goal. Um, but but how can we start to shift that conversation so that that when we have the, the options are there and, and we can actually make some measured decisions about which which trip for or which which mode for which trip. Uh, mm -hmm. And so I think there's just a lot, a lot encouraging coming there. Straight, did you want to jump in on that, Melissa? No, no. Oh, oh that's that's <laughs> Uh, so on that, I'll just say too, there are many other questions we didn't get to, and, and I recognize too that I did prioritize a little bit in the questions that I asked those that, that had ref, re relevance in particular to mid-sized cities and to and to, to Windsor just because of our context here. Um, but I have, again, the questions are all there, um, and I know Melissa and Chris, you're doing a lot of, a lot of work uh, around the world and you do other talks as well, so hopefully um, those conversations continue to happen. Um, I want to thank you again for taking all the time and, and thank all of our audience too. We had, I think, 150 on the call today, 360 registered, uh, and, and we'll be sending out a link to the recording as well to all those who registered, because I know for some it was a question of making sure that they got to hear you one way or the other. Um, really appreciate you taking this time. And just lastly, um, as we close to, to note um, the two events coming tonight, the bike ride at six from the bike kitchen, Sandwich Brewing Company uh, at 6.30 for those who were registered for this event. Um, we will be checking your registration um, and to note that on the 17th of May, you'll be back to, to talk with uh, and to do a three hour workshop with the city of Windsor uh, administrative staff, as well as County of Essex, both upper and lower tier municipalities. And we've been working with the municipalities on that to put that together. So from that perspective of all hands on deck and breaking down the silos, um, we look forward to learning a lot more from you there. Thank you again to, to you. Thanks to everyone for being here and uh, we'll see you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you. Bye.